Life in a small town is supposed to be predictable. That's the beauty of it. Every day, the same faces, the same places, the same routine. Everything makes sense. Until one night, a school librarian returns home as usual, has a bite to eat, and then, without warning, vanishes. Suddenly, nothing makes sense. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Police have been called to the home of school librarian Sylvia Thompson. The school principal says she didn't show up for work this morning. She didn't call in sick either. My concern started about five minutes after the time that she usually arrived. Sylvia normally greets the children first thing every morning. She's never late. The fact that she wouldn't be there without letting us know was very uncharacteristic. Uh, it was like clockwork. Uh, the buses would roll in at 20 to 9. She was there. And uh, I can't remember any day that she missed this duty. The principal says he called Sylvia repeatedly, but she didn't answer. He decided to go round to her house. When he got no answer there, his next call was to the police. The local constable asks detectives Jim Miller and Sean Evans to investigate. Inside the house, police find Sylvia's coat, boots, and purse. Why would she leave home without them? The rest of the house was impeccably clean and tidy. There was a gas fireplace that was on uh, with the flame burning. There was uh, one Lazy Boy recliner, beside which was a small side table. On that side table was a tray, uh, some dishes that had remnants of a meal. The principal says it's not like Sylvia to leave behind dirty dishes or forget to turn off her fireplace. The detectives ask if Sylvia seemed upset about anything recently. Did she ever mention going away? There were no thoughts of her being depressed or, or of such, especially since she just celebrated her 50th birthday. She was in a very cheerful mood. So there was no indication to us that there was anything where she would perhaps have left for any kind of reason. The principal then notices something missing. Sylvia had two recliners in her living room, not just one. The detectives are concerned. If you decide to disappear, why would you take a recliner with you? News of Sylvia's disappearance has spread. Neighbors come forward, anxious to help police. She was last seen by a neighbor going into her home 7, 7.30 in the evening, and then the next morning she's nowhere to be found. The community was quite upset about somebody had gone missing out of their home. One of there's uh, some wild person on the loose abducting people. Police decide Sylvia's disappearance merits a full investigation. She's declared a missing person. The school community, of course, became quite concerned. And there was a lot of concern about the children 
being traumatized by this. Children just loved to be with her. She was very caring, and she listened very carefully to children. She was a very professional teacher, and it showed. I mean, it showed in everybody that we interviewed uh, just how much of an impact she had on so many people's lives. Rumors start to circulate. Some people are even saying Sylvia's been killed. There was tips from uh, people that they said that uh, she was dumped on along the roadside on certain roads, uh, that she was dumped in a pond uh, kind of southwest of town. Townspeople fear the worst. With police help, they form a search party and comb the area. I don't think any of us believed that we would find a body. We believed we would find some kind of clue, however trivial, that may, may have be some of assistance. Of course, in the back of your mind, you always harbor that uh, intrepidation. If Sylvia was ever in the vicinity, all signs of her have vanished. The search is called off. One searcher then comes forward with new information. He tells police he's the stepson of Sylvia's boarder. His stepmother has been away on holiday for several weeks. The evening before Sylvia disappeared, he went by her house to see if his stepmother had returned. Sylvia said she hadn't. The young man tells police Sylvia then invited him in for a visit, but she asked him to leave at eight. She said she was expecting someone. Police want to know who that someone might be. Police conduct a complete forensic examination of Sylvia's house. We had a forensic identification team uh, come in looking for any kind of evidence that may assist us with the disappearance of the victim or any suspects that may have been in the house. The identification team finds 12 shoe prints. Police eliminate the prints of anyone who entered the house after Sylvia disappeared. They expect to find Sylvia's shoe prints and those of her unknown visitor. That's not what happens. Their prints have vanished. But the forensic examination isn't over. I sprayed the floor with luminol, and luminol is a blood enhancement chemical that is used in order to locate blood. This chemical basically glows in the dark the officer discovers a blood smear under the couch. Two blood profiles later emerge. They determined uh, through examination at the Center of Forensic Sciences was a combination of uh, male and female blood. The female blood sample belongs to Sylvia Thompson. The source of the male blood is unknown. Police are now certain Sylvia is the victim of a violent attack. The question is, by whom? In a small town, a school librarian has vanished. Physical evidence suggests foul play, but no body has been found. There was a candlelight vigil, just to give some relief to people, because as time went on, the spare set in and prayer did help. From the perspective of, of fear, uh, people not knowing uh, you know, if there was some person loose in the community that was breaking into homes, uh, certainly affected the, the neighborhood she lived in. And everybody in, in the small community was certainly had, had a lot of concern, asking us if they should be afraid for their lives. Police receive hundreds of tips. Every one of them needs to be chased down. And we had a number of phone calls from uh, people that lived within the immediate area and about observations they made of the victim's residence on the 5th of January, 1998. Neighbors report seeing a pickup truck in front of Sylvia's house at midnight. Although the, the descriptors of the truck did somewhat vary, they were fairly consistent in that it was a small pickup truck with some distinctive marks on it. 
Investigators realize they've already spoken with the truck's owner. He is Martin Edelenboss, the last person to see Sylvia Thompson before she disappeared. Midnight sightings of his truck in front of her house would conflict with his statement that he left at 8 p.m. Police run a check on Martin. He's done time for sexual assault and is out on parole. When I had my discussion with the parole officer, she had nothing but good things to say about uh, this individual, that he had uh, um, been a model parolee. There had never been an issue as far as uh, a breach of conditions. She had no concerns about him being uh, in the public. Police learn Martin Edelenboss is a heavy equipment operator at a nearby landfill site. A better place to hide incriminating evidence would be hard to find. Police need to know more. We decided the following morning that we would start to send some investigators down there um, to start to do some interviews. Investigators ask what happened here on January 6th, the day of Sylvia Thompson's disappearance. A driver remembers seeing Martin early that morning when the driver came on shift. Investigators ask him if he saw Martin dump any garbage that morning. The driver says he didn't see Martin dump anything. It's a busy sight. Police conclude that if Martin dumped something, someone here would have seen him. Investigators then learn a nearby power plant is protected by security cameras. All trucks going in and out of the landfill site are monitored. We uh, obtained copies of those uh, videotapes and uh, found a vehicle coming in around four, quarter to four in the morning. The tape shows someone dumping something, but the images aren't clear. The pickup truck looks a lot like Martin's. Investigators return to the landfill site. They need to know Martin's exact movements that morning. On that particular day, he was not supposed to start work. Uh, until 7 a.m. Uh, he, in fact, had arrived early. We started to learn of some very peculiar behavior that he had exhibited at the landfill site on the morning, the 6th of January. The driver now tells police that when he arrived at the site that morning with a load of garbage, Martin insisted it be dumped in a specific spot. Martin then went round to the rear of the truck to watch the load being dumped. This was a very significant safety violation within the tipping area. So this was something that uh, he should not have been doing. Was there something at the landfill site that Martin wanted to hide? Police believe there was. I had a pretty good gut feeling that he was in there disposing of the chair or the body or both. If Martin used his truck to transport Sylvia's body to the dump, a forensic examination will prove it. Police seize the vehicle. An identification officer searches Martin's truck for physical evidence. Blood causes luminol to glow, but so does rust. The truck bed is so rusted out, there's no way to distinguish one from the other. Sylvia may have been at the truck, but the investigators can't prove it. To make the case, they've got to find her body. They mount a massive search. There was thousands and thousands of tons of garbage dumped uh, a day in that landfill site. And um, it was just uh, a huge task even to, to, to try and take it on. We taped off an area probably about the size uh, of two football fields where we were going to commence our, our search. And uh, I wanted to go down uh, 20 feet. We searched there seven days a week through all kinds of weather. The stench from the, from the landfill site was horrendous. We found numerous rose-colored chairs. You know, I didn't believe there was that many uh, rose-colored chairs around. 
On day 36 of the search, investigators find the remnants of one more chair. There's a label stapled to the wood on the chair that had the victim's name on it. That even gave me a stronger indication then that, that, uh, that the victim was probably in there somewhere as well. Police need to keep close tabs on their prime suspect. But Martin Edelin boss has left town. Police learn he's in Niagara Falls, where he's just been arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct at a strip club. By leaving his hometown, Martin has violated the terms of his parole. He's picked up just 100 yards from the US border. We believe that he might be trying to maybe run across the border and disappear. Police don't have enough evidence to hold Martin, but they warn him that if he breaks parole again, he'll be taken into custody. Two months after Sylvia was declared missing, the search area has been excavated to a depth of 20 feet. I made a decision to uh, go back another uh, 50 feet and go down another 10 feet. I don't think I was not very popular with the searchers at the time, but they knew it had to be done. I left the landfill site probably about 2 o'clock that afternoon, and uh, at about five minutes after 4, I got a call from the supervisor at the landfill site saying, you better come down here right away. We found something you'll be interested in. I went in and, and looked at what they had found. The body was partially involved in a piece of carpet. We believed it was the person that we were looking for. After a two-month-long search, investigators have discovered what they believe to be the body of missing librarian Sylvia Thompson. The remains are sent to pathologist Martin Queen. A direct comparison of the pre-mortem dental x-rays and the post-mortem dental x-rays will lead to a definitive identification of the victim. In the small town, the discovery of Sylvia's body hits hard. We, in a lot of ways, of course, had been expecting the worst. Yeah, that's only natural after so much time. But that didn't lessen the impact and the, the grief that was shared. Investigators believe Martin Edelin Boss is Sylvia's killer, but they have no physical evidence connecting him to the crime. They decide to test his truck a second time. To find blood that has not been contaminated by rust, they take the truck apart. Hidden in the wheel well, having entered through a crack in the truck bed, the examiner finds blood. DNA tests reveal the blood matches that of Sylvia Thompson. We determined that, that we had sufficient evidence to, to arrest Mr. Edelin Boss for, for first degree murder. and uh, I attended the scene and placed the accused under arrest. Less than 72 hours into their investigation, Martin Edelin Boss introduced himself to police as a concerned friend. Now, police know exactly how he killed Sylvia Thompson. What we learned was that uh, early on at work, the accused was involved in some consumption of alcohol. He picked up a carpet at the landfill site. Not too drunk to drive. Not too drunk to find his way to Sylvia's house. He knew her border was away. That meant Sylvia would be alone. He knew she would remember him from her party. Upon arriving at the home, he um, knocked on the door. 
He was uh, invited into the residence, and very shortly thereafter, there was uh, a physical assault. was strangled with significant force and was then raped. Why the accused did what he did, you know, the only thing I, I can say on that is he acknowledged that he went to the home that night specifically to have intercourse with the victim, and he was fully prepared to use force. The accused remained within the victim's home for several hours during which time he had uh, undertaken some steps to clean up. But Martin missed a spot, leaving a trace of his DNA behind. We believe that he had took the body to the Keel Valley landfill site at 4 o'clock in the morning, dumped it in there. He got rid of the blood-spattered recliner at the same time. When the first driver arrived at 6 that morning, Martin directed him over to Sylvia's body. Martin believed he'd made Sylvia vanish, but he was wrong. She is still remembered. Children just loved her, and there were hugs often given to her. She was a gifted teacher. Every time one of her students reads a story, Sylvia lives on. For the crime of first-degree murder, Martin Edlenboss is currently serving 25 years with no possibility of parole. Success in a new country can be sweet. Just ask Amrik Singh Gadwar. The young salesman has a senior business partner showing him the ropes. He has a good family. He has a beautiful wife. He has a lot to be thankful for. Tonight, he'll take a special pill, just so his wife will have something to be thankful for as well. But tonight's the night all the young immigrants' dreams will end. Crime, investigation, and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. <laughs> Hamilton, Ontario is home to many new Canadians. One of them, Amrik Singh Gadwar, has just turned up dead. The coroner rules he died of unexplained natural causes. One month after Amrik's death, his business partner, Sukhwinder Singh Dillon, files an insurance claim on Amrik's life. Insurance claims agent Clifton Elliott is assigned to the case. When he arrives at the business partner's house, Elliott has a sense of deja vu. I just glanced over as I was parking and noticed there was two statues at the bottom of the steps leading up to the door. And I suddenly had a feeling I'd been there before. I rang the doorbell and Mr. Dillon came to the door. I didn't recognize who he was immediately, but I knew I'd seen him before. Dylan tells Elliot he and Amrick had life insurance policies on each other because they were in business together. They sold used cars from the driveway of Dylan's house. Normally, the payment of this kind of claim is straightforward, but not this time. 
The fact that I'd seen Mr. Dillon before and I'd been to the residence bothered me to the extent I thought, no, I'm going back to the office. I checked the files under the deceased name, but there was nothing. So I checked them under Dillon, and I pulled a file on a Mrs. Dillon. 18 months earlier, Dillon's wife had gone into convulsions and died. The coroner ruled she died of unexplained natural causes. Dillon collected over $200,000 in insurance. It was too much of a coincidence for two people to die under the same circumstances without there being an explanation. Elliot turns over the information to Dr. Chitra Rao, his contact at Hamilton General Hospital's pathology department. She decides to run some tests. When I was in medical school in India, I had seen lots of these cases. Being victims of Indian origin, um, first thing came to my mind was, could it be chloroform, could it be arsenic, could it be strychnine? All you need is five milligrams of strychnine to get toxic effects. And within five to 10 minutes, the patients will go into spasm and convulsions. They die of respiratory and then cardiac arrest. Three days later, the lab results are ready. I got a call from the toxicologist and say, hey, what you guessed was right. He does have strychnine in his uh, bloodstream. The presence of poison in Amrick's bloodstream means Hamilton police now have a murder case on their hands. Detective Warren Coral is assigned to investigate the death of Dylan's business partner, Amrick Singh Gadwar. Coral is also interested in the death of Dylan's wife. I'd learned that these two people who had died really had no medical history that, that uh, should cause them to die the way that they did. Um, it was suspicious. Coral orders toxicology tests on the remains of Dylan's wife. No strychnine is found. The cause of her death remains a mystery. Coral decides to focus on the murder of Amrik Singh Gadwar. Coral and his partner, Kevin Dinsa, pay a visit to Amrik's family and his widow, Jasminder. They need to find out more about Amrik's relationship with his business partner. Police learn Dylan and Amrik were very close. Even though Dylan wasn't a blood relative, Amrik called him uncle. Police also learned Dylan has promised Amrik's family the entire $100,000 insurance settlement. Clearly, any suspicions Dylan stood to benefit personally from Amrik's death are unfounded. Police ask family friends what happened the night Amrik died. We had learned that uh, the victim had sold a vehicle on that day. They bought some alcohol and they were sort of celebrating this sale. At one point during the evening, Amrik complained of back pain. We had learned that there was some discussion about him taking some sort of a pill that his grandmother had actually given him at that time. He showered, he shaved, and then he went to bed with his wife. Him and his wife actually had sexual intercourse prior to him attempting to go to sleep. It was at that time that he went into convulsions that are specific to strychnine poisoning. Jasminder cried out for help. Amrik's family came running. Amrik died within hours. Police are told Jasminder and Amrik had a stormy marriage. Jasminder had threatened to leave with their son a number of times. The victim didn't treat her very well. His family did not treat her very well. 
We had learned that, in fact, she was an abused woman in that household. The detectives know poisoning is an intimate crime. You have to be close to someone to poison him. Who was the last person with this individual? It was obviously the wife. She was the last person with the victim. So we had three people that uh, we had to take a step back and take a look at to see who, in fact, may have had the motive to murder this uh, victim. Was it the wife with the troubled relationship? The grandmother who had given Amrick the pill? Or the business partner who was holding an insurance policy on his life? Coral and Dinsa believe family members know the answer, but they're not telling. A young man named Amrik Singh Gadwar has been murdered. Hamilton police have three suspects, his business partner, his grandmother, and his wife. Amrik's business partner, Sukhwinder Singh Dillon, stood to make $100,000 on the insurance, but he has since promised that money to the victim's family. Amrik's grandmother reportedly gave Amrik a pill just before he died. She now stands to get a share of the insurance money. Amrik's wife, Jasminder, had many grievances against her husband and his family. A family friend tells police at the visitation after Amrik's death, she witnessed an argument between Jasminder and Dylan. For an Indian woman, especially a daughter-in-law living under her in-law's roof, to be so outspoken is virtually unheard of. Amrik's grandmother soon ended the argument. But Jasminder's behavior is very different around the police. She was very submissive, always looked down, wouldn't make eye contact, which is not suspicious itself, but too submissive. Jasminder seems anxious to avoid any contact with the police. When police press the family for more information, none is forthcoming. Police decide polygraph tests are in order for all three suspects. First up is Amrik's wife, Jasminder. When asked, did you poison your husband? She answers, no. But when asked if she knows who did, her answers become vague. She looked as if she had something to say, but she wasn't going to share it with us. Dinsa believes Jasminder is probably not the killer, but he thinks she knows who is. Amrik's grandmother doesn't understand how the polygraph works. Police decide to question her instead. She, too, is vague and evasive. Police come away thinking she has something to hide. Amrik's business partner, Dylan, refuses to answer any more questions halfway through the test. He knows police can't force him to take a polygraph. Amrik's family is becoming impatient. They want to know when they can collect the insurance money. The police are happy to provide an answer when Dylan agrees to a polygraph test. And we confronted him in a manner in front of the family, and the family says, well, you can take him right now. And, of course, it, Dylan knew that to keep face with the family, he had to take a polygraph. When asked if he was involved in Amrik's death, Dylan denies knowing anything. And he failed the polygraph. But failing a polygraph is not proof of guilt. The detectives decide to press harder. We interviewed this individual for 13 hours. He keeps telling me that he hasn't done anything wrong, he's not responsible for it. 
We tell him that he's still lying to us. Coral obtains a warrant to search Dylan's house. We were gonna vacuum every inch of that house and then take a look inside of that vacuum bag to see whether in fact there was strychnine in it. Police find no evidence of strychnine in the house, but they do find something else. We actually found videotapes of other wives that he had married in India after his own wife's death. Dylan remarried three times in quick succession. Police learn all three wives died under suspicious circumstances. After we learned about these things, we realized that investigatively, there was a lot of similar fact evidence that could be gleaned from traveling to India and doing our own investigation over there. We traveled to different parts of northern Punjab, basically tracing Dylan's movements. What police learn in India shocks them. Dylan married one woman who bore him twins who died while in his care. While still married to her, he took a second wife. She too died from what looks to have been strychnine poisoning. Detective Dinsa has no trouble buying strychnine locally. Dime size, brown colored, the raw form, very poisonous and they cost roughly about 25 cents Canadian, enough to uh, kill a community. The Indian leg of the investigation is over. Police return home convinced Dylan is a killer. But just because he can be connected to suspicious deaths in India doesn't mean he can be arrested for his business partner's murder in Canada. The day after their return, investigators get a call from Jasminder. Amrik's widow tells Detective Coral that after a violent argument with her in-laws, she has fled their house for the safety of a women's shelter. She's upset. She had to leave her son behind. Jasminder says she's ready to talk to police about what happened the night of Amrik's murder. She was now coming forward to tell us the truth. Police know what Jasminder has to say could break the case wide open. A young widow is prepared to tell police what happened the night of her husband's murder. Jasminder says, after the celebration, Amrik came to bed. He then told Jasminder a secret. Dylan had given him a special pill to help him perform better in bed. Shortly after they had sex, Amrik went into convulsions and died. Jasminder says she told Amrik's family about the pill but because of the insurance money Dylan has promised them, they're keeping quiet. Jasminder says she tried to confront Dylan herself, but he denied her accusations. Can police trust her? They come up with a plan that will enable her to get her son back and then to hear for themselves what the family has to say. We got an East Indian speaking officer who actually some, uh, doesn't look uh, East Indian. We told him that he was to assist the Children's Aid Society in assisting the victim to retrieve some belongings and her child from the victim's home. We told him to listen to what the conversation was in the house. He was not to say anything that would suggest that he was East Indian, that he understood what was being said. We learned the victim's wife had been told that you will not cooperate with the police. You will not do anything that would allow us not to get that money. The family threatened to tell police it was Jasminder, not Dylan, who gave Amrik the poison pill. Thank you. 
we believe we had a pretty compelling case. After a year-long investigation, police arrest Dylan for Amrick's murder. The police are convinced Dylan killed his first wife as well, but they need proof. Coral asks for a second test for strychnine to be done on Dylan's wife's tissue. Dr. Joel Mayer, toxicologist at the Center for Forensic Sciences, examines the tissue samples. Since the first tests were done, new technologies have been developed. The samples went through their final preparation stage. The results of the analysis clearly showed that strychnine was present in the tissue blocks obtained from the deceased wife. Police now know how Sukhwinder Singh Dillon committed the murders. First, he brought strychnine tablets back from India. He then used a mortar and pestle to grind them into powder. He put the poison into gelatin capsules, which he then deceived his victims into taking. And the worst thing about it is strychnine is such a terrible death. It's a death that nobody should die. Detectives met the killer within the first 72 hours of their investigation, but it took them a year to collect enough evidence to arrest him. Dylan murdered his wife in Canada for the insurance money. Police believe he murdered his wives in India for their dowries. He then returned to Canada to look for his next victim. He'd gotten away with the death of his wife. He figured that I got insurance money from my wife's death so I'm going to take an insurance policy out on my business partner. Had it not been for the long memory of an insurance agent, police believe Dylan might have kept on getting away with murder. The night Amrick died, there was another hitch in Dylan's plan. He never expected Amrick to live long enough to tell his wife about the pill. Dylan had no choice but to promise the family the insurance money. He had to deflect suspicion away from himself. Because of the promises that Dylan had made, the family chose to keep that wall of silence up, thinking that we've lost our son anyhow. We might as well look after who's now living. In the end, the family's plan also came up short. The police investigation into Amrick's murder revealed Dylan had lied to the insurance company. He and Amrick were not blood relatives. They weren't legal business partners either. The insurance policy was deemed invalid. Amrick's parents and grandparents who had hidden the truth about Dylan were left with nothing. Jasminder has been shunned by Amrick's family. She now lives alone with her son. Actually, she's a true hero in this investigation. She came forward, did the right thing. Sukhwinder Singh Dillon was convicted of the murders of Amrik Singh Gadwar and Rupinder Kaur Dillon, his first wife. He is serving two life sentences in a federal penitentiary.